Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, the Biden budget. On March 9th, the Biden administration released its budget for the 2024 fiscal year. The proposals largely focus on the same goals as last year, but there were a few new additions in the mix. So what are these additions, and will they result in new policy? Tax Notes reporter Alexander Rafat will talk about that more in just a minute. Later in the episode, we'll hear from Tax Notes federal columnist Amish Shah about his upcoming column on the intersection between clean energy and tax. But first, Alex, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Dave. Good to be back. Now, I understand you recently spoke with someone about President Biden's budget. Could you tell us about your guest and what you talked about? Yeah, so I talked with Kyle Pomerleau of the American Enterprise Institute, who's been a guest on our show before. We reviewed some of the key tax provisions in the budget proposal. As mentioned, there are just a few new items added in Biden's budget this year. But I think what's interesting is examining how the tax measures play into the administration's wider political agenda. And so we delve into that. We get into the intricacies of some of the most consequential tax proposals, as well as examine the prospects of any of these measures actually being enacted. All right, let's go to that interview. Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I guess to start off sort of on a big picture, what was your immediate you know, big picture takeaway from the proposed budget? Yeah, so I think first the administration should get credit for addressing budget deficits. Um, the federal budget, it faces some pretty big long-term challenges where federal spending, especially mandatory spending on Medicare, Social Security, They are growing as a share of GDP, while federal revenues are staying about still over time, and that creates a growing deficit that lawmakers eventually are going to have to address. And Biden is putting forth proposals in his budget that would reduce deficits by roughly $3 trillion over a decade um, against the OMB, the Office of Management and Budgets baseline. Now, Another big takeaway here is that there's not all that much that's new. Uh, A lot of the tax proposals in the fiscal year 2024 budget are very similar to the fiscal year 2023 budget. The tax increases are focused on high income households. Um, They focus a lot on raising taxes on capital income of of these high income households. And we'll probably get into why I think on average, a lot of these proposals are more complex than they really need to be. Um, And that's, again, a holdover from the previous budget tax proposals. And as you mentioned, you know, there wasn't really a lot of surprises in this budget proposal. But was there anything that you saw in there that you didn't expect or something that you saw as sort of surprising in its in the structure? So not necessarily surprising, but a couple things that are a little different that are worth pointing out. So the excise tax on on buybacks, um, he proposes raising that from 1% to 4%. That is a new proposal. Um, And then the debate now over Medicare finances is being pushed by the administration with this increase and expansion to the net investment income tax and the increase in the Medicare additional surtax. These are somewhat new proposals in the budget that were not in previous versions. And looking at sort of the political side of things, how has Biden's pledge not to tax uh, anyone earning less than $400,000 a year shape the structure of some of these provisions? So I think this this goes back to my point about these proposals being more complex than they really need to be. Uh, when Biden was running for president, he put forth a pledge not to raise taxes on any households earning less than $400,000. Now, there are lots of problems with that pledge, one of them being your exempting about 98% of households from potential tax increases. Um, And then the second big challenge is that it makes proposals more complicated than they really need to be. I think an example here is the net investment income tax expansion or these tax increases on high income households in order to finance Medicare. 
these proposals only apply to households earning over four hundred thousand dollars. So there, he's raising the net investment income tax rate from three point eight percent to five percent only on income only above four hundred thousand. He's applying the net investment income tax on active business earnings of uh, S corporations and partnerships. Again, only applies to households earning over four hundred thousand dollars. There's a number of smaller provisions and base broadeners. For example, there's a provision related to depreciation recapture for real estate. Again, only applies to households earning uh, more than $400,000. So this, this is an added level of complexity that's just not needed. If these proposals are good policy, well, some of them are reasonable policy. Some, I think, might be less reasonable policy. It stands that then these proposals are worth doing across the board. It's not, I don't think it's necessary to add this additional tier of complexity to the tax code. You know, on top, it's on top of a tax code that's already too complex. Um, tax reformers, we want to simplify the tax code. Um, this is moving in the opposite direction. And then another problem with this, with the pledge, is I think it also worsens the economic cost of raising additional revenue. I mean, there's more than one way to raise an additional dollar in federal revenue, and narrowing the base to households earning more than $400,000 increases the rate increases you'd need in order to raise the same amount of revenue. Net investment income tax, raising that rate from 3.8% to 5%, their proposal there is going to raise about $650 billion over a decade. You could raise roughly the same amount by raising the Medicare payroll tax by less than a percentage point. Um, so we're talking about much different rate changes due to how narrow they're making their tax base here. Support for this podcast is provided by the University of California Irvine School of Law Graduate Tax Program. This preeminent and innovative program prepares students to practice tax law at the highest level in the U.S. and abroad. Featuring a low student-faculty ratio, cutting-edge technology instruction, and dedicated career support, UCI's Graduate Tax Program helps prepare students for a future in tax law. Program graduates are placed in top tax-related industries, practicing law in many major U.S. cities. Applications are open now. For more information and to apply to this highly selective program, visit law.uci.edu slash gradtax. That's law.uci.edu slash gradtax. And what are your thoughts on Biden's proposal for a minimum billionaire income tax, as well as his, his attempt to once again, bring the U.S. in alignment with the OECD agreement by introducing uh, the under tax profits rule. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, so there, there are two big proposals, and these two big proposals are from the previous budget. So those are being reintroduced. Um, the first one is this billionaire's minimum tax. And what they're proposing is a minimum tax that would apply to households with wealth over $100 million a year. And households above this threshold would be required to pay the greater of their ordinary tax liability or 25% of what's called total income. Total income is roughly adjusted gross income plus unrealized capital gains. Um, this is the appreciation of assets um, that haven't necessarily been realized in a given year. Payment of this minimum tax is spread out over five years, and these payments would represent a prepayment of future taxes. So if you were to ultimately sell these assets for a profit, you'd be able to get a credit for any minimum tax you've already paid on these sales, the sale of those assets. This was introduced last year, but there's a slight difference. Last year, it was a 20% tax. This year, it's now a 25% tax. That's probably meant to correspond with the net investment income tax changes where the capital gains tax rate of 20% plus the net investment income tax is equal to 25%. Now, the goal here is to reduce the benefit of deferral. So it's the ability for taxpayers to delay tax payment on capital gains. Um, and I think there are two, two general issues with the tax worth considering. One is complexity. 
So it's not clear why this needs to be a minimum tax at all. Um, so if eliminating deferral is important, which I think a lot of people believe that's the case, Biden should propose broad reforms to the income tax that limit deferral. Um, so instead of having yet another parallel tax system um, that adds complexity. And then there's an efficiency issue. So proponents of reducing deferral argue that it means that capital gains are taxed more like interest that you'd receive on a bond. So that's that's a potential benefit of limiting deferral. Um, however, it also reduces the after-tax return on savings. So raising the tax burden on capital gains means that you might be discouraging some saving and investment at the same time. So those are two big issues there to consider for the billionaire minimum tax. Um, and then the, the OECD minimum tax, they are reintroducing reforms to the tax treatment of multinationals that they had put forth in their previous budget. Um, and this dates back, again, another campaign proposal. And you mentioned that it would align the tax system with the OECD minimum tax, but I wouldn't say it's exactly aligning the tax system. I think that after these proposals are introduced, I'd still say the U.S. system would be somewhat of an outlier in several respects. Um, so there are three major changes here. So the first is with the global intangible low tax income, this is the minimum tax on multinationals that the U.S. has currently, it would raise the rate on that to 22%. And that rate would be 75% of the corporate rate that he's proposing of 28%. So that's 21%. And then there would be a foreign tax credit limitation. You'd only get 95 cents for each dollar you pay overseas. So that ends up being a maximum uh, minimum rate of 22%. At the same time, it would eliminate um, the qualified business asset investment deduction. This is the exemption that businesses have for a routine return on investment um, of 10% under guilty. This would go to zero. And then guilty would also be made, the guilty calculation would be made on a country by country basis. Um, the second major change is that it would eliminate the base erosion anti-abuse tax, or BEAT, um, and it would adopt, as you mentioned, the undertax profits or undertax payments rule. And this rule is a, it's effectively a backstop to the global minimum tax to prevent companies from inverting in moving their headquarters to non-compliant countries to avoid the minimum tax regime. And this under tax profits rule um, would only apply to companies with revenues over 750 million euros or $750 million. And then the third big change is it would repeal the foreign derived low tax income or the FDII deduction. Now, going back to what I mean that the US would be an outlier in a couple of respects is that while adopting the under tax profits rule and making guilty a country by country calculation would move more in the direction of pillar two or the OECD minimum tax, having the minimum tax rate at 22% and eliminating the qualified business asset investment deduction, QBI, would be different than what pillar two is doing. Pillar two, of course, is a 15% minimum tax, not a 22% minimum tax. And Pillar 2 also has an exemption for routine returns of 5% plus 5% of payroll. So the U.S. tax system would be somewhat more burdensome than what Pillar 2 is proposing. And then another difference here is that guilty would apply to all multinational corporations, whereas the Pillar 2 income inclusion rule, which is similar to guilty, would only apply to countries above a 750 million euro threshold. Um, so there are differences here, again, making the U.S. system a little bit more burdensome. So in some ways, they're aligning. Some ways, it's not. The U.S. would have a lot, uh, would place a larger tax burden on multinational corporations um, than countries that align with the global minimum tax. And so another proposal that he included in the budget that he has been trying to pass legislation recently uh, as an expansion of the child tax credit um, that would be up to $3,600 per child under the age of six, $3,000 per child over the age of six. What are your thoughts on that proposal? On one hand, it's been linked to, it was temporarily introduced 
under the American Rescue Plan, and there were studies that linked it to a drastic reduction in child poverty, but there's also been concerns over the cost of such a program. What are your thoughts there? Right. The child tax credit expansion in the budget is an expansion that lines with the CTC expansion that we saw in 2021, the ARPA child tax credit expansion. It would increase the size of the child tax credit, make it fully refundable, and make it available to households that report no earned income. And the, the proponents of this proposal point to its ability to reduce after-tax and after-transfer poverty um, because you're transferring income to households, um, their disposable income increases, and that's a direct reduction in poverty. Opponents um, point to both the potential impact on work incentives because the, the proposal eliminates the phase in of the child tax credit and introduces a new phase out of the benefit. It's raising marginal effective tax rates on households, all else equal. This reduces the incentive to work for households, so you'd see a reduction in work. And then a, a second issue is the cost. Um, this is a proposal that costs north of $100 billion a year. And in order to make a proposal like that sustainable, you're going to have to find tax increases that, that pay for that. And I think that this, this is actually an issue that I don't think has gotten a lot of discussion in the context of the child tax credit debate. Um, while we can talk about the poverty-reducing features and the work incentive features of the child tax credit in isolation, I think it's also important to think about those in the context of a full proposal that is paid for. So if you enact a child tax credit that costs $100 billion or more than $100 billion a year, you're also going to need a tax increase to offset that cost of that new credit. And that tax increase is inevitably going to impact households in similar ways. It's going to raise taxes on certain households. It's going to also have impacts on work incentives. Um, so ultimately, some of those costs and benefits need to be evaluated in a broader context where you are enacting another tax. And now you can enact all sorts of different taxes. Biden, I think, would choose to raise taxes on high-income households rather than low-income households or middle-income households. That changes the calculus there. But I think that broader context has been somewhat ignored in, in the debate over the CTC expansion. Support for this podcast is provided by Practicing Law Institute. Check out Practicing Law Institute's tax planning program taking place this spring. This popular three-day event brings together esteemed faculty for an insightful review of the legislative, regulatory, and judicial developments in Subchapter K and important partnership transactions, controversies, and trends. For more details and to register, visit pli.edu slash taxplanning23. That's pli.edu slash taxplanning23. And so taking into account you know, all these provisions, the White House has mentioned that not only you know, do these provisions um, you know, will help those who are middle and lower income, but that it will also pay for itself by going after high net worth individuals and large corporations, and that overall his plan is fiscally sound. In your view, how fiscally sound is Biden's proposed budget? At the beginning, I said I give Biden credit for addressing the budget deficit, or at least looking at that, that and taking it seriously and proposing a budget that would reduce um, deficits by $3 trillion over a decade. Um, so I think that, that in, in terms of deficits, it's heading in the right direction. Um, now, overall, the budget still faces significant challenges. Uh, there is still, um, after that $3 trillion, there's still trillions in budget deficits um, that lawmakers need to address. Now, I don't think that the federal budget needs to be balanced down to a, a zero deficit, but it needs to get to the point where it's sustainable, um, where debt as a share of the economy is not consistently growing. Um, and that is still an issue under Biden's budget. So that's still unaddressed. And then on the on the tax side, again, I reiterate my criticisms. I think the, the pledge he's put forth 
ties his hands in ways that one, makes his proposals overly complex, and two, really limits the types of tax increases that he's willing to put forth, some of which I think would be much better at addressing budget deficits than what he's put forth. Um, I think having a pledge that you wouldn't raise taxes on households earning less than 400000 immediately takes off the, the table proposals such as a value-added tax or a carbon tax. Um, these are additional sources of revenue that the United States doesn't use currently that it could to both address budget deficits while also reforming other taxes. And, you know, in terms of the prospects of any of these proposals, are there ones that you see that have more realistic chance of being enacted, some that have no chance, some that with minor adjustments could be enacted? Where, where do you see the prospects of, of some of these big tax proposals that Biden is making? I think the most realistic assessment is that none of this is really going to happen. The, the makeup of Congress has changed. The Democrats don't have the White House and both houses of Congress anymore. So I think tax increases are out of the question. So any of these proposals for in the short term are really not going to pass. That said, I do think it's worth keeping an eye on some of these broader issues. The OECD minimum tax, I don't think that issue is going away. As other countries adopt the minimum tax, and this starts to impact US-based multinationals, I think that there will be pressure on lawmakers to address that. And I think that there is a natural policy cliff or deadline for that. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the individual provisions are set to expire at the end of 2025. Along with that are changes to tax treatment of U.S. multinational corporations. That seems like a natural time at which lawmakers could think about the global minimum tax. But in the short term, I don't think um, there's much movement on any of these policies. Kyle, it's been fascinating getting your insights, and it will certainly be interesting to see how it all plays out. Thanks so much for joining. Yep. Thank you for having me. And now, coming attractions. Each week, we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is executive editor for commentary, Jasper Smith. Jasper, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, Three professors argue that Form 1040 should be updated by strategically and prominently adding new questions that reflect modern technology and social science research. Three former IRS commissioners offer strategies for deploying $80 billion in long-term IRS funding. In Tax Note State, Jacqueline Linez Flanagan argues that the tax revenue benefits of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program illustrate the need for additional Innovative Approaches to Immigration Reform. Robert Willens examines the most recent Office of Tax Appeals decision in California, which suggests that the state's tax authorities have wholeheartedly embraced the Metropolis decision. In Tax Notes International, Mindy Hertzfeld examines what a truly inclusive global tax organization might look like and how the United Nations could build one. Stephen Dunn examines U.S. laws concerning U.S. residents' interest in U.K.-based pension plans. In Featured Analysis, Joe Thorndike examines efforts by members of the Nixon administration to weaponize the IRS through staff changes and putting pressure on the commissioner. On the Opinions page, Joe Thorndike considers whether Nikki Haley might be the person to revive the bipartisan tradition of voluntary tax return disclosure by presidential candidates. And now, for a look at what's new and noteworthy in our magazines, here is Tax Notes Federal Editor-in-Chief Ariel Greenblum. Thanks, Jasper. I'm here with Amish Shaw, partner at Holland & Knight in Washington. Welcome to the podcast, Amish. Ariel, thank you for having me on. We're excited to partner with Tax Notes on this energy tax column. Great. We're excited to partner with you, too. We're here to discuss that upcoming column that you and some of your colleagues at Holland & Knight are preparing to launch. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, happy to do that. So this is an incredibly exciting time in the energy tax space. You know, when we look back at what's happened in this space, you know, you look back at, you know, 2002, where we had Colston fuel audits, which is the time a lot of us started practicing in this space. And that was a time where we learned a lot of lessons with all of those audits. Back in 2004 and 2005, there was a massive expansion of energy tax credits. 
And since then, there have been incremental changes to these credits, and, and not suggesting they weren't important, but they were more incremental. But the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act last year, like we saw in 2004 and 2005, is just an absolute game changer. So what we're planning for this column is, of course, a, a number of articles that will talk about the IRA tax provisions and some of the guidance we've already received and some of the guidance that we expect to come. And we'll pepper into that, hopefully, some helpful analysis based on you know, decades of experience working in these tax credits. But our plan is also to address related topics that tax professionals in the energy sector could bear, should bear in mind. So that includes things like using tax insurance for energy tax credits and, and, and how that fits into the IRA and the under, other energy tax issues that we see. We'll get some input from our government affairs team on legislative activity in this space. We're spending a lot of time with our government affairs team addressing issues in the, in the IRA. And, and we also need to keep in mind, I think tax professionals need to keep in mind all of the non-tax opportunities as well through DOE and other non-tax funding for clean energy projects. So we'll plan to talk a little bit about that as well. Got it. Thank you. Well, it should be very practical and very insightful. So thank you in advance. Where did the idea to tackle this come from? You know, we, we know that there is an incredible amount of interest in this space, particularly since the IRA passed. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in it before the IRA, but it's expanded exponentially since then. You know, our team has never been busier with calls, with clients, with colleagues, with government officials. And with each call, we learn even more, and we think even more deeply about all of the opportunities in the IRA and some of the challenges as well. And so, you know, we're excited about this column because it gives us the opportunity to share some of what we learned, obviously the things that are confidential, and, but to share that with, with others in the industry, including, you know, I know that there are a lot of tax practitioners who are really just getting into this space with the passage of the IRA. And, and one of the things that I found, you know, during my career is that I've benefited a lot from the sharing of ideas. So we're hoping that We'll share some ideas in this column and, and that readers will reach out to discuss any of those columns or issues and ideas with us as well. But but at the end of the day, I can't take credit for the idea of this column. One of your colleagues, who was actually a former colleague of mine as well, uh, mentioned it to me. And this is a publication I start with each day, uh, read it with my morning cup of coffee. Uh, so I'm thrilled to work with the tax notes on this column. Mm -hmm. Well, very practical, very germane. Very topical. So we're very excited about it. Thank you again. Before we let you go, where can listeners find you online? So I'm most active on LinkedIn. So actively post on LinkedIn, any updates, any articles that we see. I appreciate anyone who wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, or you can feel free to send me an email as well. I'm always happy to chat by email as well. And that would be amish.hklaw.com. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today, Amish. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on. You can find Amisha's upcoming columns online at taxnotes.com. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tax Notes, for more in-depth discussions on what's new and noteworthy in tax. Again, that's Tax Notes with an S. Back to you, Dave. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at tax stew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening, and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Want to see more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, as well as showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish.